If there's one place on the planet that abounds with beauty and natural resources, it is here, Africa. It's a continent endowed with tremendous untapped potential. But in order to seize the opportunities of the 21st century and compete on an equal footing on the global stage, the continent will need to overcome its social development challenges. Not least of these is the welfare of the rapidly increasing urban poor. The Millennium Development Goals for Water and Sanitation serve as an entry point to development and economic growth. UN Habitat's Water for African Cities program is working with governments, non-governmental organizations and communities to attain the MDGs concerning access to clean water and basic sanitation for the urban poor. The program was initiated in 1999 and its second phase launched in 2003. Water for African Cities has made a significant impact on the lives of ordinary people in 15 African countries. We think by getting utilities, local, local authorities, etc. together in our UN Habitat approach of involving the stakeholders uh, and looking at issues in, in, in water management and that can be about how to share the river, how to share the groundwater in tours or how can we construct public latrines and so on. But those activities as such uh, have, played, have played a role. The Water for African Cities program objectives are tracked through six priority thematic areas. Pro-poor governance and follow-up investment, improved sanitation for the urban poor, water education in schools and communities, water demand management, urban catchment management, and advocacy, awareness raising and information exchange. We originally started off working on three principal areas. One was on water demand management, the second on uh, protection of, uh, of water resources from the impacts of urbanisation, and the third area was dissemination and outreach. But that uh, recently, has, uh, in the past five years, has been expanded uh, to include other uh, priority areas such as uh, sanitation, monitoring and specific focus uh, on the urban poor. The aim of focusing on pro-poor governance is to support change in existing structures so that people with low incomes are given a voice in collective decision making. This will in turn lead to improved access to good quality drinking water and basic sanitation. But it's not as simple as it sounds. The attitudinal changes necessary to ensure that the poor come along can be very challenging. And to a very large extent, we underestimated, uh, in most instances, the length of time required to get the poor, particularly in the areas that we are working in, to come along and set up the necessary structures that need to go along before you put in the infrastructure for them. That has been quite a challenge. But through awareness raising efforts and advocacy, the Water for African Cities program overcame this hurdle, resulting in low-income groups gaining more power and influence both through representative political structures and through direct participation in water and sanitation provision. The Community Development Committee in Sabo Zongo, a low-income neighborhood in Accra, Ghana, spent a great deal of effort mobilizing the community for the construction of a 20-seater sanitation block. This was necessary to tackle obstacles that included land disputes and court cases. It was done before the inception. There were workshops, there were group discussions, men groups, the chiefs, everybody got involved. And we explain why we should own it and sustain it. And that is exactly what we are doing. Kibera is a densely populated informal settlement in Kenya's capital, Nairobi. It took years to bring the community on board to provide for the relocation of families and ultimately the construction of a road by UN Habitat to open up the settlement to this project. It would not have been possible without the participation of the community leaders through their settlement executive committee. 
the sensitization of the community and mobilization towards this particular program was done away back in the year 2004 when this committee was incepted. The people in the slum, they were never positive to any attempt to come and, you know, improve the slum. The involvement of UN Habitat, you know, contributed a lot in instilling that faith in the people to accept this particular program. The town of Dondo in central Mozambique is a good example of pro-poor governance at work. The community here is involved at all stages of the project, from planning and construction to management of their own facilities. The local people also provide community labor and gain new skills that they can later transfer to other income-generating activities. I think by adopting participatory planning, by involving the neighborhood in the process, we are ensuring ownership of the project. Meaning that the activities belong to the community from the beginning and people get motivated and committed to participate in all interventions. This will also guarantee sustainability. Approximately 40% of Africa's population has no organized system of sanitation and relies on unhygienic facilities, if any at all. Although both women and men benefit from improved sanitation, the facilities have a bigger impact on the lives of women who are faced with difficult issues of privacy and safety when seeking places to relieve themselves. Most of the houses don't have any toilet at all. Most of them use the paper bags and then they put in their feces, they do what they do and then they throw it, that's the flying toilets. So almost all the drainages, they are just full of feces. Niono is an old city in the West African country, Mali. A 50 kilometer long canal runs through the town and beside it, the main market bustles with activity. With an influx of traders and a lack of suitable sanitation facilities, the canal has come under threat as the people use it for anything from laundry to urination and even open defecation. Through the Water for African Cities program, a modern public toilet complex has been constructed in the marketplace. UN Habitat's intervention here in Niono has been very helpful for our city. Every Thursday and Sunday we receive between 1,500 and 2,000 people coming to sell their goods in Niono. And that is a big challenge in terms of sanitation. With the public latrine UN Habitat has developed, people now have good conditions. Here, you can have a bath, you can deposit your luggage, and there are also toilets for disabled people. In Burkina Faso, through Water for African Cities, a modern, spacious toilet block was constructed to serve the public in the capital, Ouagadougou. City residents pay a minimal fee to use the facility. Similar high-spec facilities have been built in several other project cities, such as the Ngor area of Dakar, Senegal. Harar is a walled city in eastern Ethiopia. This city faces a major water crisis with a very low level of water supply coverage. This is the Garaule community. Here, more than 80 families live in a dilapidated building which once served as part of a military camp. Before this intervention, they had no sanitation facilities to speak of. Under the sanitation component of the Water for African Cities program, a toilet complex with showers was built. The block is fitted with a rainwater harvesting system. The residents pay a small fee to use the facility. There is a separate reservoir to capture and store clean water for domestic use. UN Habitat also donated two mobile waste bins to improve solid waste management in the commune. The sanitation condition of the community before the project was awful. Most of the people were beggars. Now five members of the community are employed as guards and shower room and water point attendants. 
We have built a small shop using the money that we have generated. Masaka Secondary School lies on the outskirts of Kigali, the capital of Rwanda. The school community comprises just over 1,700 pupils and 36 teachers. Prior to this intervention, sanitation facilities were far from adequate, but the school has benefited tremendously from the Water for African Cities program. Forty new toilets have been constructed here and the project has gone beyond the basics to take on an environmental and entrepreneurial approach. The Water for African Cities program is working towards creating a new water use ethic among school children and by extension the community at large. This is being done through an innovative school and community curriculum called value-based water education. The initiative focuses on three key areas, the establishment of water classrooms, setting up a water curriculum in selected schools, and helping raise awareness in the local community. In sub-Saharan African legalities and uh, uh, technicalities have not been able to solve water-related problems. So it was decided that in order to appeal to the conscience of the people, if we add values to it, it may change their lifestyle and they will treat water-related issues very well. In addition to the setting up of water classrooms in most of the program cities, this initiative has also implemented a well-crafted strategy to take the clean water and hygiene gospel into communities. There is no doubt that fresh water, the planet's most precious natural resource, is in short supply and nowhere is this more evident than in Africa's growing cities. Water demand management experts say that we could increase supply merely by planning and controlling water use. A utility produces, uh, say it produces 100% water. 60% is wasted or lost uh, alongside the way through broken down infrastructure, people wasting, ill-disciplined uh, consumers. Now if you can lower the non-revenue water or the wastage, then immediately you, got, you have a lot of water available that you have already paid for as a utility that you can sell to people or give to people of the low income. This principle is illustrated by the Ghana Water Company, which through the Water for African Cities program has adopted a geographic information system. The computer-based system provides the utility with accurate spatial information to make timely decisions regarding their water supply network. Now we know the locations of our customers and uh, in the process we are able to identify illegal connections that hitherto the system couldn't uh, identify. So the project helped to rectify some of these anomalies that we have in the system. So it reduced non-revenue water appreciably. On the East African island of Zanzibar, the main supply comes from groundwater, but these water sources are being depleted faster than they can be replenished. Zanzibar receives just under 1,600 millimeters of rainfall annually, and Water for African Cities is working with the Zanzibar Water Authority to take advantage of the rainfall to better manage supply and demand on the island. We have got some rain season, too heavy rain season, we call it Masika and Vuli, but yet we don't have uh, technicalities on how to have it, those rainwater. And uh, underground water costs us a lot. You inhabitant is here now, training our experts on how to harvest rainwater. So we have the crucial need of depending on other sources instead of this groundwater. UN Habitat has installed the infrastructure to harvest rainwater at a number of schools in Zanzibar, including Mugambo Primary School, where the installation has had an immediate impact on the student body. 
The problem we had before was that we had to leave school to go and fetch water from the well and it took a lot of time. Secondly, we had problems when we needed to use the toilet, looking for water every time. But now these problems have reduced because there's water from the tap and in the toilets. The town of Dori in northern Burkina Faso presents an interesting illustration of water demand management. The Water for African Cities program funded a study which resulted in the construction of a series of water ponds that capture rainfall. The water is then distributed to this mainly pastoral community providing clean, safe water for both the residents and their valued livestock. We asked UN Habitat to help us in mapping the requirements of the city of Dori, not only in terms of what to do with the rain water, uh, in particular uh, how to uh, find ways by which the water would go as quickly as possible into the main pond, but also how to conserve part of that water for at least part of the time for domestic usage. Due to the rapid growth of Africa's cities and socio-economic development, the pressure on the limited fresh water resources has increased considerably with growing demand and misuse of the catchment areas. Urban catchment management seeks to protect and secure the quality and quantity of water resources. Water for African Cities has developed and implemented strategies which involve working with local utility companies to improve drainage and solid waste management in local catchment areas. In northern Senegal, in the St. Louis region, Water for African Cities is working around the Lac de Guerre. The lake is a chief source of fresh water for the city of Dakar, the capital of Senegal, which lies hundreds of kilometers to the southwest. Thirty villages stand on the shores of the lake, and the increased human activity threatens the lake's natural ecosystem. The program has intervened to improve the sanitary conditions in these villages. There are two types of activities that impact the environment. There are the farmers who graze their animals in the fields and also cultivate the same area. There are also those who bring their animals to the lake to drink water. And these two activities have a direct impact on the lake. Here in the village of Diokor Il, a microcredit scheme has been put in place to help poor people access credit to build their own household sanitation facilities. We knew about this project through the awareness campaign. We went and got credit from the microcredit institution. We paid 22,000 CFA over nine months. We paid little by little and now we have finished paying. Before we had this facility, we used to go into the bushes to bath and for our toilet needs. Now we have a toilet and a bathroom and we find it very useful. Wager Lake is situated 17 kilometers from Ghana's capital, Accra. It was formed by the construction of the Wager Dam across the river Densu. The lake supplies more than 50% of Accra's water. But the Wager Reservoir has come under threat from human activity on its shores, including quarrying, human waste disposal, and overfishing, which leads to an increase in the level of algae in its waters. The Water for African Cities program, in collaboration with the Ghana Water Resources Commission, embarked on a mission to protect the lake. From previous experience, it was found that advocacy, awareness raising and information exchange campaigns played a pivotal role in changing people's perceptions and attitudes towards water issues. This has become an important thematic priority to support program implementation. One of the aims is to engage at political and policy level to gain support for the program. At community level, it involves outreach programs and education to trigger attitudinal change.
In addition to capital investment in the water sector, focus has also been placed on complementary investment in training and capacity building to ensure sustainability beyond the programme. The lack of water and sanitation services traditionally has more of a negative impact on the lives of women and girls than their male counterparts and hinders them from enjoying other human rights. Water for African Cities is working to achieve a critical balance of gender roles in the provision of water and sanitation for the urban poor. The program is helping to empower women in water management and to raise gender awareness among key stakeholders. A clear strategy and action plans on gender mainstreaming have been woven into the main fabric of Water for African Cities. As a result, there has been a tangible increase in participation by women right from the level of physical construction of infrastructure through to community leadership and policy level. <laughs> In the beginning, there was some fear that women could not perform tasks perceived to be for men. But we are doing it, and we are committed to continue until the end of the project. Schools in poor neighborhoods of African cities often cannot or do not address the needs of women and girls, both in terms of location of sanitation facilities and dealing with their specific needs during their monthly cycle. The program has seen the design and construction of separate washroom stalls that cater for both girls and boys in schools. In the participating cities, the personal safety and dignity of women and girls has been greatly enhanced by the construction of household toilets through microcredit schemes. Each city in the program has its unique action plan to implement Water for African Cities' gender mainstreaming strategy. I think it's very satisfying to see a programme which was born out of a, a meeting many years ago, uh, a historic meeting uh, held in, in, in Cape Town in, in 1997, where we looked at this concept of a, of a regional programme. It's very satisfying to see from its humble beginnings, the programme go into something now which covers many cities in many countries and uh, is sort of a leading sort of best practice, if you like, for, for your inhabitants. As African cities increasingly serve as engines of growth, the continent's population will continue to migrate to urban centres. The demands on governments to provide adequate sanitation and water supply will keep rising. Initiatives like the Water for African Cities programme play a vital role in bridging the demand gap, but the real value of demonstration projects such as Water for African Cities lies in the capacity of governments and local authorities to upscale and replicate them. This will ensure sustainable access to proper sanitation and safe drinking water for Africa's urban poor, making a tangible impact on their lives and serving as a stepping stone to a brighter future. The project is very unique, very proper. I'm very happy.